went on to become a, a pioneer in radio, which we all benefited from because we got to hear music that we never would have heard before without this man and the group of people. Uh, he, of course, was Michael Stanley. I would say, it's always hard. Uh, Michael Stanley's first manager. Uh, he went on to manage Joe Walsh, uh, Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, uh, Dickie Betts, and a host of others who will be talking about tonight. So give it up, please, for David for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, how many of you know Kim Zonable? Okay. How many of you know Charlie Weiner? Okay. I didn't know they were the same people for a long time. I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd read this guy's books. I'd get them at like, the Cleveland airport, and I'm like, this guy's really a good writer. And then I saw that he thanked Alex Bevan in a book. So I called Alex and said, this guy, Kim Zonneville. He says, well, you know him. I said, no, I have no idea who he is. He said, it's Charlie. I said, Charlie who? <laughs> he said, Charlie Weiner. That's, that's his real name is Kim Zonneville. And I call him up, and I'm like, Meet me at Jack's. We have a book to write. And then uh, COVID hit, so we had plenty of time to write. <laughs> right. Plenty of time to write it. And um, I mean, he made my dream come true. I, I never thought I would be standing in front of people saying, well, you know, I am a published author. Mm -hmm. But he made that come true for me. So give it up for Charlie, Kim, whatever the hell his name is. Okay, this, Charlie, sit down and ask me questions. This book, <laughs> this book, book was uh, an absolute journey of love. It was a journey of, uh, of uh, awakening. And, uh, I, you know, I, I have to say, <laughs> I think David and I actually had the same experience when we had gotten done. And it was like, you have to go through it one more time. And it was the first time either one of us had actually read it. Because otherwise, it's like you're always going through, you're looking to make sure that things are spelled right. And, you know, it's, it's, so you're not actually reading it. Well, the, both of us, the first time we read it, about halfway through, we're like, this is a really cool, who is this guy that is so cool? And I was like, oh, as a friend of mine, Dave was like, oh, it's me. <laughs> so it was very fun. And, uh, and uh, I think that the coolest thing about um, putting this together, if I may, uh, was our first, of course, 90% of this was done at Jack's, because that's how it works. And uh, the first, very first time we sat down to discuss the book, and what we really wanted to do, uh, David had one rule, and one rule only when it came to the book. And that was, if it started to interfere with our friendship at all, that would be the end of the book. So I am very happy to say the book, the book is, book finished. is here. <laughs> so David, um, there, I, I, so you all know, there, there's like really a lot of stories. And that with their, uh, as I was writing it and putting it together, after every chapter, I would look at my wife and go, that's my favorite chapter in the book. And she would look at me and she goes, you said that about everything. Because it is. It's all my favorite chapter. There are, there are just fantastic stories in here. And so we're going to talk about like some of the people, some of the big people. Let's talk about Paul McCartney. Uh, when you, when in the book, I just wanna, I'm going to give you a little lead in here. In the book, you talk about when Yusuf was doing Road Singer. And he did a song called Boots and Sand. And as you're leaving the studio, he says... I hear Paul McCartney on this. And you're like, oh, do you know him? And he goes, well, I sat across the stage from him one time. <laughs> and then David says, well, you know, he, I'll give it a shot because you had done something with him before. Well, and what was that? Well, we'd done some stuff at the, when I was at the Rock Hall with right. Paul McCartney's office. So I said, well, I know people in his office. I'll give him a call. So I called Paul's office and I said, uh, you know, I'm working with Cat Stevens, uh, Yusuf Islam. And, uh, and he, he was wondering whether Paul would sing harmony with him on one of his songs. And they told me, well, you know, he really doesn't do stuff outside of like the other Beatles or people that he's producing or whatever. And I said, well, can you, can you please give him the message? And here's Yusuf's number. He can call Yusuf and they can talk about it. But if you could call me back, here's my number. So the next morning, about 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm, we're, I'm asleep in my hotel room, and my phone rings. And I look, it says, you know, unknown. And I'm like, well, I usually don't answer unknown. But 
I'm in a I'm in a different city. Maybe the hospital. It's a hospital calling, and that's how it comes through. So I answer it, and I hear this voice go, uh, "Hello, is this Yusuf?" And I said, "No, it's David." David, Paul McCartney. <laughs> uh, uh, well, hi, Paul. How are you, man? Like, uh, geez, it's great to hear from you. Um, he's like, I, I get to sing with fucking Cat Stevens. Are you serious? And I said, yeah. He says, well, give me the information. So I give him all the information. He sets up a studio. And uh, the next thing I know, like three days, or, uh, I'm leaving for London. My wife and I are in the car. My son's driving us. Phone rings. I, don't, I wasn't answering it because I was driving. And my son looks. He says, it's unknown. I said, but there's a message. So it's a message from McCartney. And he's saying, hey, do me a favor. Call me back. I got something to go over with you. So I'm thinking, great, it's over. He's calling to say I can't do it. But now I got Paul McCartney's number. Um, <laughs> So I call back, and it's like, hey, Paul, uh, it's David. Everything okay? He goes, yeah, yeah, I was just talking to Yusuf. He told me I should ask you, you know, should I bring the, the Hoffner bass, or should I bring, like, the, uh, the Rickenbacker? And I'm thinking like an idiot producer. I'm going, well, you know, bring the Rickenbacker, Paul. That's going to that's gonna sound a lot better, you know? And, uh, and he says, okay, see you tomorrow. I'll hang up the phone. My son says to me, you know, you're an idiot. You could have had your picture taken with the Beatle bass. Couldn't you have said, like, bring both of them? We'll see how they sound. I mean, anyhow, so I didn't get to hold the Beatle bass. And um, we get into the studio, and I get a, Paul, a call from Paul's office saying, you know, if I could wait outside for him. It's in London. It's raining. It's March. And uh, I'm just standing there, and I'm waiting for, like, these lights, you know, like big search lights coming towards me with like thousands of people, Paul, Paul, Paul. <laughs> and this guy taps me on the shoulder and he goes, Dave? And I said, yeah. Oh, Paul. He says, shouldn't we go in? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I, it was like, I thought, wow, he just like walks around. But he had like a baseball cap and sunglasses and sweatpants and and it was like the absolutely the, the coolest day of my life, except for family stuff, you know? It was, I, I called my brother in New York. I'm, going, I'm sending you a picture right now because I'm not sure this is really happening. I said, I think I'm in the, I'm in the studio with Paul McCartney. And uh, he says, well, and Cat Stevens. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's normal, you know? <laughs> but Paul McCartney was very, very cool. And um, he was coming to Pittsburgh uh, on his next tour, and he had given me his, you know, the number, and he said, look, you know, if you ever want to come by and see a show or anything, you know, just call. So I heard about it after the first night he was playing, the second night he was opening the new hockey arena in Pittsburgh. And, um, and uh, so I called when I knew he was doing a sound check because, you know, I didn't want him to go, why are you bothering me? You know, all that stuff. And I come into work the next morning. The first message on my machine was from Paul. And he's, oh, Paul, it'll, Dave, it'll be great to see you. Come on by. Come to the sound check. We're going to have a good sound check party. And then we'll do dinner, all vegetarian. I know you'll be happy about that. And he says, uh, you're going to get a call from my guy, and you know, and he'll set everything up for you. So the guy calls and sets us up with like 12 different laminates and everything. But this is like only the second night they're using this stadium. And we had to drive around forever trying to find where the parking was because nobody knew where to park people. And by the time we got there, the sound check was over. Uh, he was just taking a shower before the show. And um, so we're just hanging out backstage. And, uh, and I didn't get to see him. But we go to our seats, we're like third row right in front of him. And during one of the songs, he goes, come on, Dave, sing louder. I can't do it all myself. You know, and all these people are going, oh, my God, who is it? <laughs> he's just, um, I mean, he's the, re he's the reason I, I started to do whatever it is that I do. Because, what, like everybody else, when I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan that night, it, um, it changed my life.
Well, that's the thing that you have to understand is that of all the people David has ever worked with, known or anything else, they're there, and Paul McCartney is always here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So for you to get to actually work with him was just, although during the, you left out a very important part of the Road Singer uh, 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 recording session, was at one point, after they'd been working on vocals for a little while, uh, Yusuf decided they should take a lunch break, went across the street to this Pret, which is a sandwich shop there, came back oh, with a bunch okay. of sandwiches, but he only bought one vegetarian <laughs> sandwich, not realizing that Paul was also vegetarian. And so, uh, so Paul so looks what at, happened? So that they're all on this table. Well, not this particular table. <laughs> it might have been this tablecloth, though. Um, there's all these sandwiches, and one just says, you know, veggie. And Paul picks it up, and he's just as I'm picking it up, and he says, oh, is this mine? And I said, uh, well, it w was mine. So he broke it in half, hands half to me. He took half, and he goes, you know, I owe you lunch. So the next day, I had to go over to his office to get these papers signed, and I'm standing there with uh, his assistant, and Paul walks in, and he goes, what, we're having lunch today? <laughs> <laughs> get it while you can. Yeah, yeah saying, exactly. Say stuff like that. Yeah, of course he didn't have money with him. Um, <laughs> well, now, you were just down with uh, 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 Billy Bob Thornton, who is also uh, has some stories in the books. Uh, where you were down there visiting, and what did Billy Bob think of the book? Well, I, uh, he was supposed to play in Cleveland at um, downtown. I can't even remember the name of the What's the place downtown in the flats? Uh, is it Nautica or the... What's no, the, no, 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 no. It's the club. The oh, Odeon. Wow. Whatever the Odeon is now. Maybe oh, it's still yeah. the Odeon again. And um, some, somebody in the club or something, COVID ran rampant. This is like two or three weeks ago. So they, shut, they had to shut down for 24 hours, which was when he was going to play there. So he got, he got into town and said, we're just leaving, but uh, why don't you come down to Atlanta? We'll hang out for a couple of days. So I went down last Monday and Tuesday, and, uh, and we had just gotten the books. Charlie just brought me the books on Sunday. So and Billy says, and bring me a copy of that book, you know, if it's done. So I took it down there, and the first thing he wants to do is see the book and, see, and, and look for his name, of course. And then, of course, had comments about the pictures that were chosen that he wasn't in. Um, <laughs> and other stories that could have been told about him. But anyhow, he insisted on posing with the book. He put it up on his website. He on stage that night, he said, everybody has to buy this book, you know. And he was, it was, um, he's, he's uh, we've had a strange relationship for about 20 years now. Um, I've been with him at like some of the best moments of his life and some of the worst moments. I was with him when Angelina called him and said, I adopted a kid. And he's like, excuse me? <laughs> you did what? And of course, that's what ended up ending their marriage, you know, no trust and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I've also hung with his Academy Award and stuff. And, and he, he introduced me to some people because he's both in the rock and roll world and, and the, the movie world. And his whole thing is, he used to say to me, who do you want to meet? And one day, you know, I'd, I wanted to meet Bridget Fonda. You know, she was on my list. Uh, and he had just done a movie with her. So, and he, oh, so he calls her and she's out of town. And uh, he said to me, anybody here know the movie Harold and Maude? Okay, Harold and Maude. He, um, he said, it was my birthday, so this was my birthday surprise. He had Bud Court, who's Harold, come over. Do we tell this story in the book? I don't yes. Know we do? Well, it probably doesn't translate if you're reading it, but um, <laughs> that's the problem with the book. Oh, no. Everybody <laughs> bought with the word? We all got them? Okay, I'll tell, good. I'll tell you what page is that. If you don't like it, just rip it out. Yeah. There's a lot of pages, so you won't miss a couple. So, not to like drop a million names, but basically that's what the book is. Um, we're having a birthday party at Billy Bob's house. So it's me and my wife, Billy and, um, oh, I can't think of her name. No, 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 I'm trying, not trying to think who Billy was with. Um, she's tall, her parents are an actress. Uh, who? 
Yes, Laura Dern. He was with Laura Dern at the time, so it's Billy Bob and Laura Dern. I'd invited uh, Simon Kirk from Bad Company, Tommy Shaw from Sticks, and his wife were there, and a bunch of other people, and all of a sudden, the doorbell rings, and this guy, this is in the middle of summer, I'm born August 15th. This guy in a full-length mink coat with a flare of a hat, a cigarette on a cigarette holder, not lit walks into the house and he says, hi, I know I'm the entertainment, I'm Bud Court. I don't have much time, I have to tell you a quick story, this just happened, I'm, it's fresh in my mind, and this guy's like wacko, and he's, and he's just flittering all around the room, you know, and he's going, you know I live with Groucho, you know, Groucho and I are roommates, because we have the same shrink, and he said like, you know, the shrink is the most important thing in putting people together, and, and these two people should live in the same house and breathe the same air, Groucho and Bud Court. And he says, you know, I don't do many movies now, so I'm not on the red carpet. I'm not in the... And my, my agent brings me an offer to do this thing, and, and it's a TV show, and I tell him, I'm an actor. I don't do TV. And so I wasn't on ER, and I guess... People liked it and probably would have liked me and I'd be invited to red carpets. But anyhow, I, 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 I got invited on a red carpet, which is why I'm all dressed up tonight. It's my second red carpet. Two weeks ago I was invited and I was so excited. I said to our nurse, I need a Valium. She says, hold on, Groucho's calling me. He runs into Groucho's room. Groucho has just had this minor stroke. He's on the floor. And he's saying, tell Bud he still has to go to the red carpet. It's important. And she notices that he dropped and one of his teeth fell out. So she's going to get me the Valium, and she hands it to me, and I throw it in my mouth, and she looks, and she's still got the Valium, and I took his tooth. And now I can't do anything. I can't leave the house. I send her out to buy all the, the poopamator stuff, the whatever makes you poop, and a, and, a, and a strainer, because this is his tooth. I mean, I have to keep this. I'm going to wear it around my neck. And I'm sitting there for two days uh, with the strainer. Nothing, nothing. And finally, the tooth came. All right, I have to go now. Thank you. And he just out the door. That's what life at Billy Bob's was like 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to bring the whole thing across in the book. That's one paragraph, that entire story. So it takes up like a whole page, because that's how it reads. Whatever else. Was there anything that was difficult for you when, uh, as we sat at Jack's and, 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 and talked about this? Was there anything that was really hard for you that, that, yeah, that we I, put into this? Yeah, well, there was that one server who was so loud all the time, so it's hard to talk. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah, I mean, plus effect. We're when both we deaf. went, when <laughs> we kind of did it by artist, it, you know. So it was like, well, let's talk about Dicky Betts, and you know, I have like, I I can do a book on Dicky Betts, you know. Um, so choosing things that really kind of showed who he was to me, what I am to him. Um, that was kind of important, but it was hard to find, you know, to like kind of go through the stories. And then, of course, my wife had to read everything to make sure that, well, this didn't really happen. You only think that happened because of that happening. So she had to go, and, and half the book was gone, and we had to start over again. But um, I mean, the hard part was what's left out. Um, I had like the strangest thing, I started to tell you the story before. I got a call today from Corky Lang, who was the drummer in Mountain and Wes Bruce and Lang. I don't think I've ever met this guy, but he claims that we know each other. And he told me, he says, I just read the book and the story you wrote about Joe Walsh and Leslie West, and that was the funniest fucking thing I ever heard, read in my life. He went on Amazon and said, if you like this book, you might like this. And he's, he said, oh, well, I know David Spiro. I'll buy that book. So I think about, you know, how many of those stories didn't I tell? You know, there's well, so, right. and um, 
and, and well, I guess I should tell the we Leslie West story. Um, Leslie I knew. I didn't like him, but I knew him. Um, we were doing a Joe Walsh tour that was probably around 94, 95 or something. And I get a call from Leslie and he's like, listen, I got a new band. I really want to open for Joe, you know. And I call Joe and he goes, oh, Leslie West, he's going to want to jam. I hate him. <laughs> so I say no. And then Leslie says, you know, I'll do it for this much money. And, and it was kind of a deal. And I called Joe back and I said, well, you know, he does mean people. He'll bring some people in, especially with a new band. He's doing interviews and stuff. So I said to Leslie, okay, I'll give you these 10 shows. I think we're giving them $2,500 a night. And uh, the first night was in um, uh, Atlantic City. And Joe and I were walking into the gig after, you know, during Leslie's set. And nobody saw Joe or anything, but all of a sudden, the audience was just going, and the band, by the way, was terrible. He had these kids that didn't even know his material. It was very sad. And they're all, we want Joe, we want Joe, we want, and Leslie just throws his guitar down. And he says, fuck Joe Walsh. I'm going to stay here as long as I want, and I'll let him on when I feel like it. And Joe looks at me and goes, this is the only night Leslie is playing with us, right? And I said, yeah. So uh, I called Leslie's manager and said, uh, we're sorry, but your guy's an idiot. And, uh, and he's no longer on the tour. And um, it was, uh, we thought, okay, well, that'll be it. And then he sues us for a half a million dollars because he claimed that he was about to write a screenplay with John Entwistle, and that's how much he was guaranteed. And I said, well, then you're an idiot. Why would you take $25,000 from us when you could be making a half a million dollars and it would mean something? And he's, um, you know, he's like, well, you know, I thought it was more important to be on the road and you've now ruined my career. So about a week later goes by, we actually get the papers, he's suing us. And uh, he's suing me and Joe personally and the agent and everybody who came to the show, I think. Um, <laughs> and he said, um, I'll tell you what, I got an idea. Me and Joe will go on Judge Judy. And whatever she says, <clears throat> whoever wins will each give $5,000 of charity. And I said, you're serious? And he goes, yeah, it will be great for us. What great for <laughs> you know. So I, 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 you know, I have to call Joe and tell him this stupid situation. And he says to me, you think I'm going to give that guy any kind of publicity? I mean, forget it. You know, uh, he, he, can, he can sue us all the way he wants. He, we're not giving him anything and all this. And in the end, um, his lawyer settled for an autographed Joe Walsh guitar. Uh, <laughs> and when it came time in one of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame votes that I was in and they brought up Mountain, I said, nah, they don't deserve it. <laughs> So, um, anyhow, I don't know if we told that story. But no, we didn't, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is, you have to understand, what's your <laughs> year and a half of at least once a week at Jack's, uh, I'm, I, I just brought a tape recorder and set it down, and that's this, which you're getting to how the book was written. So uh, uh, speaking of Joe Walsh and people that are all involved in that sort of thing, uh, you have to tell my wife's favorite story in the book. Which is a story I when... I thought they when, all were... Oh, no, those were yours. There's a book, yeah. Sorry. She only liked one. Is, uh, <laughs> when, uh, when Ringo wanted to put out the, uh, like the best of the Ringo's ah, tour, yes. and they had yes. a Joe Walsh tune on it, and they, they, they wanted on well, it. So what happened with that? I get a call from... Here we are, name dropping again. You can just pick them all up on the way out, all the names. <laughs> I get a call from Ringo, and he says, uh, Hey... I got an idea. Wait, what was the story? <laughs> <laughs> the, one with, the one with Joe Walsh and uh, the tune on the Ringo Starr album that he had to get uh, uh, Glenn and... Uh, oh, uh, that one. Okay. Because I also... Too many was, stories. I was right? going to the Harry Nilsson version. But anyhow. <laughs> so Ringo says, you know, Joe does this 
great version of Desperado, and I want to put that on the best of the Ringo and the All Star Band album. I said, "Cool." So I have to I have to call up Hanley and I have to call up Glenn Fry and say, "Hey, Joe wants to do this. It's also a video, which means they personally have to sign off on it." And instead of going through record label, I can just call them, which is nice. So I called Glenn. He's oh great, you know. Joe does a great version of our song, you know. And I call Henley, and he says, I have to hear it first. So I send Henley the tape, and in the introduction to the song, Joe says, this is the best song I never wrote. And he goes into Desperado, a nice tribute to the guys who actually did write it. I get a call from Henley, and he says, excuse me, you, you think you're going to use that? where he says, this is the best song he ever wrote? I said, no, he says, it's the best song he never wrote. And Don said, I heard it as ever wrote, which means that probably everybody else who hears it, that's how they're going to hear it. The answer is no. So now I have to call a Beatle. Eagles are nothing compared to calling a Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> so I call Ringo up, and I said, well, hey, Rich, I just talked to Henley, and Henley said, because of the introduction, said no. So my thought is, why don't we take off the introduction and just have the song? And Ringo said, in his best accent, you know, it's fuck Don Henley, you know? <laughs> you tell him Beatles trump Eagles every time. Sue me. <laughs> and boy, did I love making that call. <laughs> It's on the album with the introduction. <laughs> In fact, my, my wife just absolutely every time that we'll be talking and my wife will just go, Beatles trump Eagles every time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, honey. <laughs> well, um, I would be remiss uh, if we didn't talk uh, about Michael. Uh, you, I mean, when you took Michael on, you were actually the kind of the best known of the two of you because Michael was just really kind of coming up. And uh, so he how did that? Because you were you were a, record a, a store, rock, radio you know? rock star at that point. I mean, he worked at Disc Records. Right. You know, my sister worked at Disc Records. Right. You know, Susie worked at Disc well, Records. I didn't get to work at Disc you know? Records. You know, so, so I mean, why? I was more famous why and how? being on the radio. I was more famous than anybody at Disc Records. I think that's a fact. I really do. I, I think if I wrote that, nobody could dispute it. Um. This guy worked at my radio station. I was at MMS, he was at WHK, which was the AM of the FM. His name was Stan, and he was a salesman, and he used to, guy used to bother the shit out of me. Hey man, my son, he, he wrote this great song, you know, here's a tape of it, you know, oh, th thanks. Oh, my son, he wrote another great song. You know. And I paid no attention to Stan, because everybody was given, a, uh, on MMS, if we didn't get 50 tapes a day, we were at home. And then we only got 25 in the mail. But uh, everybody gave us tapes, and so you just paid no attention. So now, during the same period, Joe calls me, Walsh, and he says, hey man, I'm working with this kid from Cleveland. He's got great songs. He's using Barnstorm as his band, and I called up a couple guys from Manassas, and got uh, Dave Sanborn playing sax, and we got Richie Fure and a bunch of other people doing backup vocals. You should manage this guy. I said, oh, I don't know anything about that. He said, what, you think you're going to be on the radio when you're like 25? And I'm like, of course not. I'll be manager at McDonald's by then. <laughs> uh, and he says, you know, you got to look to your future. I think you have what it takes to manage rock and roll stars. I said, well, what do I do? He said, well, come out to California with me. You can stay at the house for a while, and you'll go to work with my, uh, with my manager, Irving Azoff, and he'll teach you the business. And uh, so I said, OK. And uh, he said, so I'm going to bring uh, Michael down to the station tomorrow. So he brings Michael Stanley down to the station. And, uh, and here comes Stan over and goes, oh, you met my son. And I'm like, what? He says, this is my son. His name is Michael Stanley Gee. His name was Stan Gee. He said, but the record label already has a guy named Arthur Gee on the same label. 
and uh, what are the chances there were three people on the label? It was um, Bill Simzik's label. <laughs> um, there were, and two of them were named D. Um, and one was black, one was Michael. Uh, so anyhow, it's decided that he needs to change his name to using his middle name, Michael Stanley. So it turns out all these tapes I'd been like tossing, I didn't have to give Joe a cut, you know. Um, and and uh, we met that day, and, and Joe said, this is your manager. Uh, he'll be back in three months ready to work with you. And, uh, and that's, that's how it happened. And, um, and I came back, and it was right around the time that Don Kirshner's rock concert was huge. It was on every Friday night. Everybody in the world did it. So I'm deciding that my new artist, Michael Stanley, who nine people in Rocky River have heard his name, um, is going to be on rock concert. So I called my dad, and I said, how would I get Michael on Don Kirshner's rock concert? He says, well, call Don. I, oh, OK. He says, well, here's his number. Tell him I told you to call. They were friends because of the Upbeat show, and, and all of Don's artists did the Upbeat show. And uh, so I call him up. I said, hey, I got this guy, Michael Stanley, just did a record with Joe Walsh, and, and we got Dan Fogelberg and Richie Fure and all these other people on the record. He said, well, you think you can get him to do the live show? And I said, I'm sure. So he says, OK, um, in two weeks. You got to, we'll, give you a, we'll give you three segments in two weeks if he brings those guys with him. I said, OK. So I called Joe, and I said, hey, I got Don Kirshner's rock concert. And he's like, great. I said, do you think we can get everybody in the band? Oh, yeah, nobody's doing anything. He just calls all these guys. Next thing, we're all in LA at, at SIR, one of the rehearsal halls. <clears throat> we're running through a six-song Michael Stanley set for TV. It's us. Ike and Tina Turner, and uh, Red Bone. <clears throat> and, um, and the whole, they got a segment, we got the whole middle segments, and then uh, Red Bone, I think, got the last segment. It was like, this is just crazy. Yeah, it's like, it was like a 20 minute segment. Everybody could yeah. rock down yeah. It was like a, an hour show. So you get Michael Stanley, who was really completely unknown at that point, who gets a 20 minute segment on probably the biggest rock and roll show of the time. Yeah, and it's, All because he didn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be dumb. I See? encourage it. Ignorance. Always stick with your strengths. <laughs> so, so that album was called Friends and Legends. And in the, there were three releases on MCA that day. Friends and Legends, Quadrophenia, <laughs> and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Which album did MCA give their might to? <laughs> well, two of them. <laughs> two out of three. And, um, and then we went to Epic. Right. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, Joe's been, um, I first met him uh, when it was the Big Five show, and he had a band called The Measles down in Kent before the James Gang. And um, are those French fries, Polly? Yeah, just a couple, please. Um, you know, you can't get French fries at the music box. Just want to, just just once again a fact. Polly was arrested and put in jail for six days because of it. But anyhow, it's another book that I'll write someday. Um, anyhow, Joe's. I met Joe when he was with the Measles, and um, and we just became like fast friends. And when he got into the James Gang and all that. Um, oh, you really were. That book right there is Aeoli, Duncan Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Dinner. What if I had an I feel like I'm at Jack's. <laughs> Every meal we have, we have, to, we have to get a half order of french fries. No matter what we're eating, we have to get a half order because, because I have to eat most of them. And then David, who has, been, who has lost about 90 pounds, over the since COVID and everything else, and so he is a. We'll, we'll just we'll a pick really at him. <laughs> um, how many people here? Fries. Seventy orders of fries, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's probably been the most important person in my career. Um, the whole reason he wanted me to manage Michael was 
to learn to become a manager so at some point I could manage him. And um, I had le after I left Michael, I went back into radio at M105 for a year and, uh, and then had a bad experience and left. Um, and then I worked for Columbia Pictures for about 12 years. And I, I, was at a, I was at this point with Columbia Pictures where I had to make a decision. I could either move to Chicago and have the biggest of all of their distribution under me, that I would be in charge of all their distribution out of Chicago, or I had a contract, they'd have to pay me out for a year. Two days before this was to take effect, and I had no intention of moving to Chicago. Um, our son, you know, was just born, and it was like, you know, this is crazy. This is crazy. I'll, I'll find something else. There'll be another radio station. <laughs> and um, and uh, she was, my wife was working with a lady whose husband ran the Columbia Pictures branch here. And he said, uh, so you're out of work, huh? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'll make up a job for you. We'll just have fun. So we did a lot of Valium, <laughs> saw a lot of movies. <laughs> and then eventually he uh, gave me my own branch. And then it, I ended up getting more and more branches under me. And then, and it was a great business, but I just couldn't see doing that forever. It was. Um, it ain't rock and roll. Yeah, it, it is. And it, I mean, it was still showbiz. Right. You know. Yeah, but it's. I was hanging, you know, with Tom Hanks and stuff, you know. Well, there you go. You know. He was a nobody. Dustin, back then. Dustin Hoff. That's right. <laughs> I didn't tell this story about Warren Beatty, but I, I interviewed him on WNCR once, and I was standing up over him, and his his hair scalp was all colored in with like a black marker. <laughs> I just did they I couldn't make a chapter out of it, but anyhow, um, maybe we should just take questions. Well, we will. But I'm gonna, there's something that we're going to one more thing, and then we're going to take questions from okay, you guys. Okay, because I forgot what uh, we're talking about. I hope, I hope what you get from the book is there is there is an actual kind of running theme that happens, uh, even though you're jumping from artist to artist. I mean, it's broken up by artists and such. But I hope that you will take the true heart and soul of the book is the fact that David has a has a thing that no matter what happens. In, in, a, in a business relationship or anything else, you have to remain friends. So it's, it's like that is the most important thing in all of this. And so uh, whether you're in the music business, when you're in whatever, uh, if you're a friend of David, you're a friend of David's for life. And that's, uh, it's, it's I, I, hope, I hope that you get that out of the book, that that's the true, who David truly is, and, and, and that's the really the important theme in the whole thing, uh, including, uh, David if you have to tell him the plot, I, I, I didn't you know, tell him how it, it ends. Doesn't, it doesn't work, you know. I didn't give. I just you get. So, um, I'm going to embarrass someone here, uh, and probably David a little bit too, because David knows people that are outside of the music business as well. And, Wait a uh, minute, I was going to do this. Huh? Do you know that in this room is a United States gold medal holder? Yeah. My friend Dan Hughes, Coach Dan. Dan Hughes. He won a gold medal with the women's uh, basketball team in the Olympics in China. He let me wear it. And uh, Dan plays a pretty good part in this book, actually. Yeah. Um, there's two people that, when I travel, just seem to show up everywhere and anywhere. Dan has shown up in about, I mean, I'm talking about standing outside the Hard Rock in Las Vegas with my wife. We'd been invited there by Aerosmith to come and hang for a couple of days. And we're just standing out waiting for Steven to come out. And Coach Dan is running on, on the sidewalk, you know, working out. Happened he was scouting a player in, in, in uh, Las Vegas. I've run into him on the street in New York, okay? There's, what, over 200 people there. And bam, I run into him on the street. All over the country, Washington, D.C., you name it. The other person is Josh Groban. 
<laughs> Do we talk about Josh in the we book? We talk about the... Josh in the book that he is no, okay. he is a running character. He's like is it's like Josh Groban has like some cameo appearances in the book because they really have ever managed them. Never, they just run into each other all the time. Yeah, I, I first met him at the Rock Hall. It was when the London exhibit was there, and I get a call from him, and and I don't know who he is, and I'm like, this guy seems to think like he's like somebody. And I don't think Google was invented in 2000, was it? I probably didn't know how to use it if it was. I, I didn't know it was but invented anyhow, yet. But <laughs> anyhow, it's, it's Josh Groban. And he said, you know, I, he was in playing in Columbus and wanted to come and see the, uh, the exhibit. So I'm walking around with him. It turns out we know like three million people together, none of them in show business. It's like, oh, well, you know, you know these people. And oh, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was very weird. And then the next week, the Grobanites, his little group of fans, they're going to have their annual meeting at the Rock Hall. I'm expecting like four or five people. Um, there's like hundreds of them. And they, they come. So I had heard that it was going to be a big number. And I called Josh and I said, you still doing, he was doing like five nights in Columbus. He says, yeah. I said, uh, what are you doing tomorrow afternoon? He says, I have to drive from Columbus to, to Detroit. I said, well, stop in Cleveland. You'll like blow these people's minds. And um, he said, what's going on? I said, the Grobanites are coming to the Rock Hall. That would be great. <clears throat> so he drives up to Cleveland, comes in. These ladies, maybe there was one guy, but he probably drove. Um, <laughs> they were out of their minds. I said, oh. Josh wanted you to guys, you guys have like a special thing. He heard you were going to be here, and they're like, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And then in he walks, and it was so, it was so cool. I mean, nothing's more fun than making somebody's day, you know? And to watch these people, this was the biggest thing that ever happened to them. And then I'm in London. I'm doing a thing called Proms, which is a huge event that they do every year, and I'm with a guy named Albert Hammond. And Albert and I are in this car, and they said, well, somebody's going to be riding with you, another artist. And in the, it's Josh Groban. About a month later, I'm up in San Francisco at the airport waiting for my car. It's me and my wife and Simon Kirk from Bad Company, a couple of the other Bad Company crew guys, and we're waiting to be taken to where we're going. And I'm on my phone, you know, complaining, where the hell's the ride, you know, blah, 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 blah. and and. And somebody goes, Spiro, I think that's the car. And as soon as the guy said, Spiro, this guy who's been standing here on the phone turns around and goes, not you. <laughs> Literally, right before COVID, I'm up at XM Radio. And uh, I was there with Petula Clark. And uh, we were doing a bunch of radio shows there. And, and Petula says to me, oh my god, look who that is. I said, who? It's Josh Groban. <laughs> You just find those people. Now can we do questions? Thanks but anyhow, Dan goal Hughes, while I find... Coach Dan Hughes. <laughs> I can hear, I can hear. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask David about anything here that I can wander around? Anybody raise your hand if you got a question? All right, hang on, let me come over there. Let's see if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a cripple besides the fact that I'm deaf, I could but tell not, a funny... I'm not deaf anymore. A miracle has happened yeah. and I've got my new battery. So there you go. Hey David, I wanted to know how you met uh, use of Cat Stevens. I know you, you did that successful road singer album together, but mm -hmm. how did you meet and what year was it, may I ask? I met, I met Yusuf when um, Moda Bone Jack on came on, came out on A&M. <clears throat> I think that was his first A&M record. So it was on Island, everywhere else. And he was doing a radio tour, I was on WNCR. I was a huge fan of Matthew and Son, um, that whole Matthew and Son album killed me. I was, used to play it a lot on the air. And so um, we got to be pretty good friends over the years. I got a gold record for T for the Tiller, Tillerman from him. And, um, and then, of course, you know, in 1977, he said goodbye, and he went away, and nobody heard anything from him. And then um, I come home. I was running errands or something. My wife said, well, this guy, uh, Yusuf, called. He said, you know him as Cat Stevens. 
And I'm going, what are you talking? I'm thinking it's my brother. I said, you sure it wasn't my brother? No, no, no. This, this was like a real, you know, English accent. And I swear he sounded like Cat Stevens. I said, okay, what did he want? <laughs> well, he said he's, he'd call you at five o'clock, or no, four o'clock. And I said, okay. So four o'clock comes, phone rings. It, it, it's Yusuf, it's Cat Stevens. And he says, I was in the office uh, yesterday of a record label, and you called while I was in a meeting with the president of the company, and the secretary said, David Spiro's on line two. And the guy said, tell him I'll call him back. What I didn't know is, is Yusuf says, David Spiro from Cleveland? And he says, yeah. He goes, well, what's he doing? It's the way he manages Joe Walsh, Dickie Betts, all these people. And he goes, well, I need a manager. He says, well, here's the number, call him. So we're talking on the phone. You know, that's back when you could fly from Cleveland to LaGuardia like eight times a day. Now you can't, you have to go through Chicago now. So I said, well, there's, I knew all the flights to New York. I said, I can get on the, I can get on the six o'clock. I'll be, I'll be at the hotel at 7.30. Come on up. Well, by the time dinner was over, I was managing Cat Stevens. And we've done projects off and on. I mean, we had a couple, like four years were pretty intense. I was in London for mostly two of those years. And, um, and then he kind of took time off again. And then in the Muslim faith, it's uh, the son's job to take over the father's business. So his, his son, Yorios, became his manager. But I've always been an advisor, and now we're. Have any of you guys seen the immersive Van Gogh? Yeah, pretty cool thing, right? Well, Cat Stevens always did his own artwork, like his album covers. He drew all that stuff, and he does animation, his own animation. So he's animated probably a dozen or two of his songs. So I went to see the immersive, and and I was like, this is amazing. This is so cool. I wish I'd been a bit higher. But um, anyhow, um, as soon as I got home, he's in Dubai, so he's 12 hour difference or 13 or 15 or whatever, but he never sleeps. So as soon as I got home, I called him. I said, have you seen this thing, the immersive Van Gogh? He goes, well, you know Van Gogh's my favorite artist. I said, yes, I do. But have you seen this? He goes, no, I have tickets tomorrow. I said, will you call me the minute you get out? Well. About 20 minutes into it, he had to leave and call me and go, what, what are you thinking? I said, the immersive Cat Stevens? And he said, yeah. Mm -hmm. So next week I'll be over in London with him and we've got the team together. And <laughs> it'll probably take about a year and a half to do all the production, but um, we're gonna have an immersive Cat Stevens all around the world, which would be kind of cool. See, so for those of you that think this business is hard, I hear nothing. Friend it just, it just happens. <laughs> See how easy this is? I, somebody, I, anybody else? Question? Question? Yeah, Deanna, hang on. Sorry, I don't have a question, but I just want to say there's a lot of rock and roll books. I think I've read every friggin' one of them. You wrote but, half of them. <laughs> <laughs> but. You always put a positive, so I haven't even read the book yet, but I've read the reviews, I know a lot of the stories that are in them, and thank you for making it, po both of you, for giving a positive, positive stories, because there's so much positive in the rock and roll world. This that is We fun. always hear, hear the on. dirt. I mean, you know, I know there'll probably be a little I mean, dirt, I've, but. Yeah, I mean, this is. Following in that, all right, I want, because this is like, it's one of my favorite stories in the book. Uh, <laughs> Tell the story of Steven Tyler at the, at the Rock Roll Hall of Fame when he came in. And you, they were doing that, <laughs> you guys were doing a TV show thing. I, I met Steven during the Upbeat days. He had a, um, what was the name of his band? Um, he was in a Boston band. He was the drummer. They'd done Upbeat a couple times. And um, when bands did Upbeat, they always knew me because I was the guy that passed out the checks. That was one of my jobs. So I knew everybody, and Stephen was the band leader. And so they're coming back again to do Upbeat, and, and on the same show are the Shangri-Las. And Stephen comes up to me, and he says, do you know Mary Weiss? 
you know, the lead singer of the Shangri-Las? I said, oh yeah, they've done the show a million times. Can you introduce me to her? And I said, well, yeah, you know, no problem. So Shangri-Las come in, I grab Mary. Mary, this is Stevie Tyler. He's in a band, or Steven Taika Lularuski, whatever the hell his name is. He's from this band in Boston. Chain Reaction was the name of the band. And he wanted to meet you. And um, about, an hour, about an hour later, Stephen comes up to me and he's like, uh, oh my God, this was the greatest time of my life. So now we skip ahead. They're getting inducted into the Rock Hall in New York City. And I was with uh, my older brother and my wife and we're just kind of walking around talking to people. And from across the room, way, way the hell back over there is Stephen Tyler. You know, David, David. Oh my God, that guy got me my first blowjob. <laughs> you know and comes and gives me this blue kiss on my lips. And I'm like, no, 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 I got it for him. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of my, you know, involvement David, with it. Yeah. Not the story I was thinking of. Oh. <laughs> I was talking about when he, when he came in to do the concert at, the, at Blossom. And that uh, was stained or whatever it was. Planned. Oh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I knew we were going to get to the blowjob story, but that's not the one I was thinking. Well, when I think of Stephen, that's all I think. <laughs> Anyhow, for those that don't know, I used to produce a TV show called Live at the Rock Hall. Um, we actually paid somebody ten thousand dollars to come up with the name of the show, a marketing team. I'd have done it for two. Anyhow, um, we were featuring all the young acts from MTV as they were coming up. It was the first TV appearance for like John Mayer and for Alicia Keys and for Linkin Park and all these bands that none of you have ever heard of because we're way too old. But anyhow, it was a very successful show. And um, I had this band Stained on the show. Um, really talented kid was the lead singer, but these, they had, they had sold like three million records. And this was a big deal for them to be doing the Rock Hall show. And it coincided with um, Aerosmith playing at Blossom the next night. And so Stephen came and hung out with me at the Rock Hall. You know, it's like, oh, we're gonna go to lunch, we're gonna do this. And I was showing him around some of the exhibits and he said, um, you know, I have this like head of mine that was used in a video. It's like, it's the wax head. And I'm like, well, that'd be kind of cool here at the Rock Hall. He sent it to my house. <laughs> and the box comes and my wife opened it. <laughs> and in this plastic or what you, whatever kind of box it was, plastic box, is Steven's head, which freaked her out. But anyhow, so we're walking around the Rock Hall and my assistant, uh, Lisa V, who probably everybody here knows, she comes up and she says, we got a problem. And I said, what? She says, well, the opening act that MTV is putting on the show tonight, Stain said they can't open the show. And I said, what are you talking about? They don't know who they are and they don't want them to open the show. Steven says, wait, tell me that story. And she tells him the story. And he goes, well, where is this stained? Where are they? Well, they're back in the dressing room. Take me back there. So nobody knows Steven's around. And he walks in. And these guys, oh my god, Steven Tyler, oh my god. So you're stained, you guys? Yeah. What's wrong with you? And they're like, what are you talking about? You guys are assholes. Did you ever open for anybody, he said? Oh, yeah, who have you opened for? Eh, well, this guy, do you think they knew who you were when you played for him? No? So who are you to take a band that MTV believes in just like they believe in you and tell them they can't be on the show? You know what? I'm gonna invite them to go open for us tomorrow night at Blossom. Because obviously, you guys, you know, <laughs> you know what we do with our bands? When somebody, me and Joe go in and go, hey, how are you? I'm Steven, Joe, how are you, blah, blah, blah. How much champagne you need? 
How much room do you need on stage tonight? You know, that's how we treat our opening acts. We want them to be great. We want them to go out there and, and kick the shit out of their sets so that when we come on, the audience is like, yeah, already. You know, we don't have to work. But obviously, you guys don't understand our business. And, and I'm pretty sure that at this time next year, we won't know who you are anyhow. And he walked out of the room. Yeah. So 10 minutes later, Lisa's back. Oh, they said it's OK if they open the show. And Steven says, well, I'll introduce them. And he did. For that, let's you know that there are a lot of really good people. That I just I love that story because just it's so emblematic of, of the really fine people in rock and roll. Because rock and roll always gets a shitty, you know, whatever. So, so that did anybody have? have yes. And it might one be more. Rude. That's only two. <laughs> it, it might be rudimentary, but um, I really love the song Rosewood Bitters. And uh -huh. since Joe was so, how did that all? Well, Joe loved Rosewood Bitters. Obviously, he recorded it. And um, I, I was at home one day, and he calls me. He says, I'm going to record Rosewood Bitters. He says, but I don't know the words. And this is, I mean, I don't think we even had fax machines yet. You know, it's like, well, I could FedEx them to you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, he goes, no, I think I got them. So he went in, and uh, I think Keith Olson produced that, Tommy. You'd, you'd appreciate that. And um, Keith Olsen, and, and he was a big Michael Stanley fan, Keith Olsen. He's like telling Joe, these aren't the lyrics to the song. And Joe's like, well, yeah, I, yeah, they are. I mean, I'm on the original, he's telling them. I think I would know the lyrics. So then we get the demo of it, or not the demo, but uh, Joe sends us the tape. And I take it over to Michael, and Michael's going, do I have to give him co-write on this? Because like he... <laughs> There's like, you know, five lines are correct. Everything else Joe just made up as he was doing, but it really helped Michael's career. It's, it's um, that album continued to sell forever. I think it had the Confessor on it, if I'm not mistaken. So that was a pretty good album for Joe, which means Michael got some good publishing of it. So. Question there. I can't tell you how many shows I went to of Michael Stanley. He was amazing, amazing. Um, anyway, my question has to do with David Bowie. Did mm -hmm. he have something, something about Cleveland or? Well, David Bowie um, broke out of WMMS. <clears throat> we actually sold, Ziggy Stardust sold a million copies in the Cleveland area, Cleveland at Northeast Ohio. Any place, it was all based on who could hear WMMS. And uh, when David Bowie came over, his first show was in Cleveland at Music Hall. And it was sold out, 3,000 seats. And then he was going up to play this little club in Ann Arbor, Michigan that held like 400 and probably sold 200 tickets. He went all around the country, you know, doing zero business. Came back to Cleveland, played Public Hall the next time in front of 10,000 people to end that tour. And... Um, he was always very thankful to all of us at MMS for what had happened because we were the ones that exploded his career. And he had invited me to come up to uh, New York to see the um, Aladdin Sane, first night on the Aladdin Sane tour at Radio City Music Hall. So I took my brother Harry and we went. And uh, we'd gone back to see David before the show. And he says, listen, don't freak out at the end of the show showbiz and we had no idea what he was talking about so he's in the middle of rock and roll suicide a guy who's sitting next to david's wife angela stands up <laughs> bowie falls back into mick ramson's arms curtain falls and everybody's dead silent and then over the pa comes tickets for the second show are still available <laughs> Fuck is that? <laughs> he didn't do it in the second show, but it, but I, I got to tell you, I don't know how many seats they sold for the second show. There were people hanging from the rafters for that show. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I I knew David very well for a short period of time, and um, I was actually the guy. I was playing him show on the road, Michael Stanley's song, Dirt. I was doing an interview with him at MMS, and 
we're playing that song, and he goes, who's that sax player? And I said, David Sanborn, you know, guy from Saturday Night Live and everything. He goes, um, I need him. And I gave him David's number, and uh, next thing I hear, he's playing on, you know, Fame and that whole, all the Philadelphia sound stuff that Bowie did, you know. It's, um, it was pretty cool to be a part of that, you know. Uh, yeah, well, if anybody, oh, wait, we have, oh, I also oh, have, a, I still have my, I still have my gold record for Ziggy Stardust. Wow. Yeah. David, why did Michael Stanley not make it all the way? Wow. Go ahead. Um, well, the truth is, he wasn't just a Cleveland thing. We could go to St. Louis. In fact, he went to St. Louis the year before he died and sold out Keele Auditorium, which is like 12,000 seats. We could go to Denver and sell 10,000 tickets. We could go to Atlanta and sell 10,000 tickets. But we couldn't sell tickets in New York or LA. And all of the rock press was in New York and LA. And um, it was the same problem that the Bob Seeger had. I mean, you know, Bob would come here and open for Michael. We'd go up to Detroit and open for Bob. Um, he couldn't get out of Detroit for years until he put out Live Bullet is when it really hit for him. And you know, we had tried to do the same a year earlier. We had put out Stage Pass and um, the only reason we did stage pass was Epic wanted to drop us after Ladies' Choice. And uh, on, on the night before Christmas Eve, Bill Simzik and I went up to New York and uh, beat up Steve Popovic, who was our label rep there, and uh, convinced him that maybe what we needed was people to hear the Michael Stanley Band live, and that would make the difference. So we did stage pass, we were on a great tour Cheap Trick and opened, we were the middle act, and then either Ted Nugent or Rush was the headliner. We always left before the headliner. Um, and we were getting great, I mean, great reviews everywhere, and every place we went to find the record, couldn't find it. Epic just didn't get the record out, they didn't believe in it. This was like, okay, we'll do them a favor, we'll give them $10,000 to do a live album and be done with them. And the bottom line was, you know, we had a number one single in probably 15, 18 cities with nothing's gonna change my mind. You know, like in, in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, or, you know, the, the, the smaller markets, but they were loving it. The Midwest was loving it, but you couldn't find the record. And um, if there's any reason why it didn't happen, I think it's at that point was really the point in their career where it was either gonna or not, and even though, you know, I had left them and and uh, Mike Belkin took over managing them and got them a, a nice deal with Capital, uh, and my town was a, a top 20 hit nationally. Once again, no New York, no LA, but they were getting on American Bandstand with Dick Clark and they did Solid Gold, and they did, you know, another rock concert. I mean, they did a lot of TV. Um, and people, you know, oh, I'm gonna go get that Michael Stanley record. Oh, they don't have it. Oh, I'm gonna buy this instead. And it's not, a, I mean, it sounds like an excuse, but it was a reality, is that the labels didn't understand what they had. Uh, much like when, you know, Capitol had, I think, three albums on Bob Sear, or, I'm sorry, um, Warner Brothers had three Bob Seger albums before anybody even knew who he was. You know, way of the world. That's the, that's the rock and roll music business, kids. But you have to understand oh, that. So gotta, Michael Stanley, Michael Stanley felt very much that he had made it. And he had done more than 98% of the people in the rock and roll business. You have to understand. So don't ever think, don't ever think that Michael was not successful, or that he, or that he felt in his heart he was, he was, he was, the most content person I ever ran across because he knew that he had done better than just about anybody. So there you go. We have a question in the back. Okay, hang on. My my big regret in the book is that when we were doing it, and Charlie had the opportunity to talk to Cat Stevens and Dickie Betts and Mark Farner and. Oh. Patty Smythe yep. and Richie Furey and a bunch of mm -hmm. other people I've worked with, Paul Rogers. 
40 mil. 40 mil. You don't hear Michael's voice in the book. Um, when he passed away, it was pretty stark news to everybody, but, you know, in his little tiny circle, which was maybe 10, 12 people, we had known for seven, eight months that he was going to be gone. There was no doubt. There was nothing they could do. Um, and it was during that period that we wrote this book, and on, we had three or four times Michael said, oh, you know, I think I, I think I have the strength to talk, you know, maybe tomorrow. And then we ran out of tomorrows. And um, Charlie didn't get to uh, interview him for the book. Um, but he's very much in it. Um, Joe's kind of like the dad in the book for me. Michael's my brother. And, um, <clears throat> and he's the heart and soul of the book. Um, it's the only chapter I personally wrote, you know, that I wrote it. Because uh, I didn't think that I could tell Charlie what he meant to me as a person, as my friend, as the best man in my wedding, as my, uh, as my other brother, you know? So um, he's in there. If, if, if he hadn't given me the shot to become his manager, I would be that, uh, I would hopefully be the general manager at McDonald's by now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hey, David. Real quick, on uh, Stage Pass, who did that great introduction at the beginning? The ladies Sorry? And on Stage Pass, who did that great you introduction? Mean, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome epic recording artist, the Michael Stanley Band. Hey. You know, I tried to get that as like a song title so I could like claim writers and everything, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David Spiro. The French fries. The French fries. Uh, we'll be around for a while. Still, uh, we've got some books. If you didn't get a book, if you want to get, if you need to get books, we'll be here for a little while selling books. David will be here to sign them. Please stop by, say hi. All right, thank you all so very, very much for coming out here tonight. Appreciate it. <laughs>